Hello, everyone. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Ravandi Natavatarana for an interview to celebrate International Women's Day as a part of our Yusinov Meet series. Dr. Ravandi is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and an infectious disease physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. The theme for International Women's Day this year is Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World, with the tagline, Choose to Challenge. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Ravandi to speak about her experiences and her career to date. Dr. Ravandi, thank you so much for taking time and talking to us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure. So Dr. Ravandi, there's a lot that I want to ask you because you've had such a, you know, such a wonderful uh, career so far. But can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, your career up to date? Yes. Um, so my family is Sri Lankan. I was born there um, and moved to the UK when I was very young, around three, um, due to my parents choosing to work there. And then um, ended up going to medical school um, at Imperial College um, in London and did a six year undergraduate degree. During that time, um, I was interested in lots of aspects of medicine. I think I knew quickly I didn't want to be a surgeon. Um, but, um, and, but infectious diseases and immunology, sort of understanding the immune system and how these different bacteria, viruses, fungi would interact with the immune system really kind of piqued my interest fa fairly early on. And I started off in medical school thinking I might do immunology and be a lab based scientist because I liked the uh, I was curious about a research career. Um, but then I um, during sort of, I guess about halfway through medical school, I'd done a lab project in Japan and came back from that really passionate about HIV immunology and then spent some time in Kenya that summer um, working on a global health um, based HIV empowerment program. And it made me think about the disconnect between advances in the lab versus in, in the field versus challenges in the field and how you could bridge that. So then I sort of started to think more about global health careers in the realm of infectious diseases and then um, and then sort of started my training in the UK postgraduate training after um, qualifying from medical school in the UK um, in the Imperial Deanery and then ended up and with a plan to pursue an academic career in infectious diseases and then ended up switching track to move to the US and I did a, a master's in public health at Harvard School of Public Health and um, on the global health track and that was an amazing experience that got me sort of thinking about the sort of the bigger picture of global health and then some of these dimensions related to the social economic and political um, aspects of diseases and particularly infections um, and then decided I would um, switch track in terms of my clinical training and move to the US and I uh, worked in, in New York at New York University and did my medicine residency there for three years and that was also you know, as you can imagine an interesting place to to live and also work as a doctor and then I ended up moving back to Boston for infectious disease fellowship and then um, staying on here at Beth Israel Deaconess and pursuing a um, primarily research career but I also do clinical time um, in doing a TB um, clinic and um, and also time on the inpatient service. Excellent. Um, and so International Women's Day 2021 focuses on women in leadership, as I mentioned earlier, and this year's slogan is choose to challenge. So what does this mean to you both per uh, personally and professionally? Yeah, this is a good question actually when I saw this it got me thinking it's part of the reason I chose my background actually um, because the background is as you might guess not Boston um, it's actually Alaska and so this was based from a trip that my husband um, and I took now I think five years ago and we did a hiking trip through for seven days where actually it was quite challenging because for me um, my husband is Austrian and quite an intrepid explorer and I'm you know more intrepid than I used to be and um, and the and the trip to, I was thinking about this this morning and one of the nice things about the trip was it was challenging we were camping and hiking for for just over a week and didn't meet other people and it was it was except one Czech mathematician who was still somewhere along the way um, but it reminded me of um, you know things that have changed obviously as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and things that have also changed in my life since that time in 2016 I'm now a parent and so that has, has, has kind of brought new mostly fun challenges and so personally I think um, I guess the post I guess first I'll say personally and professionally I think what I'm trying to do is challenge myself to do things that are hard that I think will be fulfilling whether you know the trip I was thinking about this morning but really more both personally to kind of push myself to um, take new opportunities risk failure which I think is very important and that gets to uh, the 
professional aspect as well. So some of it is challenging myself to do things that are going to, that may be hard um, and that you know, may have a risk of, of failure. And then um, and then then the other piece professionally that I've been thinking a lot about um, especially in, in global health um, and global health and medicine, really, I think we're now finally starting to sort of understand the, the long-term impacts of issues such as systemic racism in medicine, in global health and in society more broadly. And so I am trying to challenge myself to be more aware of these issues and try to actively address them. So one of the things I'm excited to do uh, next is to take a new um, additional role within our medicine residency programs. That's for junior doctors doctors um, right after they start uh, finish medical school. And so I'll um, play a role in their program as one of the social justice um, associate program um, directors. And so that I think will be a great way for me to be able to kind of continue to think about some of these issues, but in um, collaboration with our residents to think about how we in medicine um, can, can do better to care for patients and, and you know, work collaboratively together. Amazing. Um, and I think it's, it's evident from your answer that you do like to chase challenges and take them on head on. Um, but and I guess this question is just a flow from there where, you know, what was your motivation to pursue medicine other than the fact that it's obviously very challenging? Uh, but what was your uh, drive and your pa was it your passion? What drove you to pursue med medicine? You know, actually, when I was when I was younger, I didn't. I'm certainly not one of those people that decided they wanted to be a doctor as a as a child and and then stuck with that. I come from a medical family; both my parents are doctors, and actually, so it was really the opposite when I was was younger. I I used to hide my dad's pager um, when he was on call because I wasn't a big fan of him going to the hospital. Now grateful that my two year old hasn't done that yet. Um, so actually, I and then then sort of then over the sort of next years of junior school, secondary school, I wasn't I. I had thought about medicine as a career but I hadn't thought about it being something I wanted to do and um, I was quite you know as, as a child I was interested in other things like I was interested in being a librarian I was interested in being an archaeologist briefly yeah. interested in being like Kylie Minogue that wouldn't have gone as well I think <laughs> probably um, and then in in secondary school when I started to you know, towards the, GC, the, you know, the time of GCSEs, actually, I was interested in science, but also really interested in English um, literature and um, languages. So actually, I think both I and my parents thought I might have gone down more of a languages and humanities route. And then when um, we had to do work experience, I spent a week with a lawyer and then a week um, in a hospital um, shadowing different doctors. And I found the the hospital, the time in hospital really interesting because I'd sort of seen snippets of this through my parents' work. My dad is a pediatric gastroenterologist and my mom is a um, was just a recently retired beloved GP. And so I'd seen snippets bits of what they did and, and the fulfillment they got from their careers although now as a parent I think I'm more aware of the challenges they face um, both um, having moved to the UK so um, being immigrants um, trying to kind of forge their careers and then you know with the young well, with the young family which I'm now more grateful for um, so they were certainly major sources of inspiration for me both of them in different in different ways my dad dad and took a scientist um, route he um, did a PhD um, studying um, mucosal immunology based on breast milk and then um, switched track a little bit more to do medical education and so they they were definitely major sources of inspiration to me but but I think we're always very clear they never pushed us to do medicine and actually in some ways I think we're more realistic about the the challenges some of which are the same now and some of which I think have changed and so it was really that time I think when I had to make a decision you know, thinking about A levels. After being in the hospital, I was really fascinated with understanding. I liked the idea of a career that involved working with people. And um, I was really interested in understanding why is this disease or this thing happening to this person at this time? How do we fix it and how do we prevent it? And so that was really fascinating to me. And I think that was probably the big driver um, for me um, pursuing a career in medicine. I'll say actually that it, I think it's tricky actually to choose at, um, at 18 what you want to do, especially when you're picking um, vocational um, degrees like medicine, um, law and, and and others, whereas in how now having worked in the US system, um, they don't typically make that decision so young because they do undergraduate degrees and then do graduate programs. And I think there's, there's advantages 
and disadvantages to both. But um, so I'll say that I think it is it can be challenging, I think, for people to make that decision at 18. But I'm grateful that I think for me, it was the right decision. Right. Um, and, you know, in your career, you've you've undertaken many roles. But one thing that I think stood out to me personally was um, how you've worked to remove the stigma associated with TB. Um, and it's uh, some of the project work that you've done. It really caught my attention. And I, I just like to know, um, you know, what was your approach to this? Because, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to live in countries where I haven't had to worry about such things, you know, and reading, uh, reading the work that you've done in certain communities, it's eye opening for someone like me. But wh where do you think, have you seen a change in mindset towards TB over the course of, you know, the years that you've worked on this? And, um, uh, you know, what, what has that change been like, or has there been a change in that mindset, uh, you know, pertaining to stigma towards TB? Thank you. I think this is a really Im important topic and one I certainly spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, TB is a disease that I, I became, I think, most interested in when I um, spent time as a medical student in Peru um, and worked with a wonderful mentor, Dr. David Moore at Imperial, who um, who lived in, in Peru at that time and was, was sort of doing translational lab-based projects. But during the time I was there, you know, the lab was in a really poor um, area of Lima and um, it made me sort of really aware of the of of the social and economic and political dimensions of a disease like TB and really grapple with why it was so difficult given that we've you know known about TB um, for you know hundreds of years. Um, it's interesting kind of thinking back historically at TB um, because you know, a few hundred years ago, the, the concept of consumption, you know, a lot of, you know, because it was so common at the time, a lot of, um, you know, famous musicians, artists had had TB and, and, and um, actually it was, it was a somewhat desirable state to be in because that sort of emaciated, cachectic state was, was seen as in some ways desirable. And, and I think time in, in some ways. And then I think the stigma around TB, a lot of it hinges around, I think there's, it's, multifactorial a lot of it hinges around um poverty and othering and then you know more recently i think with um hiv there's a lot of stigma around tb because of the assumption that if you have tb you must have hiv as well and so there's there's, there's this dual stigma um but i think that the um so I think that that and and I think what I've realized over time is how much of a barrier stigma around um, diseases like infectious diseases like TB actually impacts the care that people receive. So I think it impacts whether they seek care because they know and, and the other piece around TB another infectious disease which we're seeing with COVID-19 is the is the issue that it's contagious to other people so then then there's the public response to TB which is necessary to to both protect individuals and and to be able to treat them to um, prevent them having poor outcomes but also from the community transmission point of view and the issue in with diseases like TB is that this has been very punitive and very stigmatizing and so people would be forced to isolate or remove themselves and I think that that and the mistrust I think in t um, that that we um, have really placed on on people with TB is I think very apparent now but it was ingrained and is still ingrained in the system um, and has been for, for decades and so um, for example uh, terms in the TB um, lexicon are things like we we have referred to people being um, as evaluated for TB who we think are very likely to have TB as TB suspects and so suspect is a terrible term because it has criminal connotations but it's just been part of the language and even now there has been a shift because there's this has been called out um, and conferences journals will specifically now have they have guidance saying you know you must not use stigmatizing language your submissions will be penalized if, if you do Another term uh, in TB is defaulter, and so that's a term that is commonly used with people who stop taking their treatment for any reason. But similarly, it has sort of criminal and um, connotations of people defaulting loans, um, for example. And so it's not a way that demonstrates understanding of what that person might be facing to be able to continue treatment. And so I think that there has been a shift to understand that I think it's been understood that stigma is, has been an issue for a long time, but I think now there's a bit more of a shift to understanding we need to do something about this because this is dramatically affecting um, the care that we provide and our ability to um, care for people with TB and reduce TB transmission. If we're ever to eliminate TB, um, reducing stigma will be a big part of it. And then I guess I'll just say that 
personally, one thing that I think has really changed my frame of thinking is um, becoming involved with an organization called TV Proof. Um, and TV Proof is an advocacy organization um, that's primarily based in South Africa and was founded by South African health workers who had been personally affected by TB. And uh, the reason for that is that health workers have a disproportional risk, you know, at least two to three times the general population of developing TB um, because of the settings that they work in, because of the lack of protection and because of widespread transmission. And TV Proof has has has, um, has uh, changed it has adapted its mission over time to be much more TB survivor led and community centric, really recognizing that solutions really have to be um, designed with the partnership and really led by people who are affected by TB. And so I think for me, I um, joined TB Proof as a member as a voluntary primarily voluntary um, based membership, but we have a team a staff team that will I'll work on various projects and. Um, Engaging with TB Proof since 2015, I think, really opened up my eyes to understanding the challenges of uh, TB. Because I think, you know, first of all, I sort of realized um, talking to health workers who've been affected by TB, even people who were well educated and had good support, um, who understood how important it was to take treatment, and many of them had drug resistant TB, which is more challenging in terms of more antibiotics, often injections for, you know, 18 to 24 months at that time. And so even those people who had support, had a good understanding, really struggled to take treatment. And it made me think about what we sort of expect of patients to really think about it from their point of view and why was that why were these treatments not um why were these treatments not um better you know why were we using treatments that were for example it, the the first line tb drug regimen um are drugs that were developed in the 1950s and 1960s so these are you know old drugs and um, that have various toxicities especially when you combine them for drug resistant tb it's even more dire with primarily older drugs but you know for the first time in 2012 a new drug for tb was developed so you know 50, 60 years between the um, original ones. And so working with um, TB and getting to know and being friends with people who have survived TB made me acutely aware of the gap in quality of care that we were expecting people um, with TB to just accept. And I think part of that gets to this is a stigmatized disease. A lot of people that get TB, although not all because it's a, um, anyone can get TB because it's an airborne infection. But a lot of people affected by TB are poor and disenfranchised and can't advocate for themselves. And so we as a community, as scientific and medical community, have just kind of expected that this standard of care that we wouldn't want for ourselves is okay. And now I think we're waking up to the fact that A, it's not okay from a human rights perspective in terms of the right to the highest quality of health, and then B, it's not okay because actually it's not good enough because we, we you know, we see massive gaps in the cascade of TB care. Um, and some of this relates to the poor quality of care, some of it relates to stigma. And so I think that there has been um, some awakening in terms of understanding stigma and the patient-centered or the person-centered lens. I think it's still a long way to go. Um, but for me, uh, that engagement with um, people directly affected by TB and communities affected by TB has really helped me. I think it's improved my, uh, it's definitely improved my practice, both as a clinician with individual patients that I care for now in the Boston setting, as well as um, elsewhere in the world, but um, also as a researcher in terms of how I ask questions and, and more of an interest in uh, implementation science and community engaged research. That's very interesting. I think it's so important to know everything that you said. It's just so important for us, even as laymen, to know, uh, you know, about what's going on in the world. And I think just drawing from your, uh, you know, the previous question, you did briefly mention um, about how certain communities, you know, are kind of safeguarded from this and or bubbled from this, um, from TB and all of these other infectious diseases. Um, it, according to you, is there sufficient awareness of TB and of other infectious diseases um, in communities that are probably not as well to do or not as um, fortunate? Uh, and what, what do you think can be done to you know, help promote or further that knowledge in these communities about these diseases that are around us? Yeah, this is a really important question because I think there's two pieces. I think there's not enough awareness 
of TB, both in communities that are really much more affected by TB, but then also in the rest of the world where there isn't as much TB, but we're reliant on political will and funding and donor support um, to be able to um, to be able to improve TB care globally. And so I think that um, because I think if you ask many people in the US, lots of people have come to me and said, oh, I didn't know that TB until COVID-19, TB was the leading cause of death in adults due to an infection globally you know it causes 10 million 10 million people become sick with t sick with tb and around 1.5 million people die every year due to tb and so um uh, and so i think many people don't understand no don't just don't know that because they because we've known about tb for such a long time and i think some of the awareness issue in the you know in the communities affected by tb and then in the rest of the world is actually part of the same problem because we've known about tb for a very long time but there's this sort of i think because it's a chronic sort of it, uh, because it's sort of chronically neglected um people don't aren't as afraid of it even though you know it can be a life-threatening illness and so i think you know in communities affected by tb i think they're they're promo many people are probably aware of someone who's had tb or the concept of having tb but i think it partly i think there's a stigma around tb and i think there's also pro a lack of recognition of who could have could be affected by TB and understanding it's this airborne disease. And so if you breathe, you can develop TB. And so I think some of the um, the ways to, I think, engage. And I think the other piece that I think we're learning now much more um, rapidly is that that um, t we have focused a lot of our identification of people with TB based on symptom screening. So do you have a cough, a fever, a night sweats, weight loss? But actually now I think we're, re we're realizing from these widespread prevalence surveys, which is where you um, you go into a community or you know within a country across different districts to do household based surveys to test people for TB and you ask them about their symptoms. And what we're realizing is, for example, the South Africa prevalence survey was released a few weeks ago and showed that just under 60% of people who were diagnosed with TB based on these surveys had no symptoms that they reported. And so that is a challenge because I think people associate, um, and same for clinicians as well, not just for people in the community. I think there's this a, a need for recognition that, that TB is really widespread in, in countries um, where, if, for example, South Africa, for example, India. And so I think understanding that it can happen to anyone. And also I think understanding that it's both preventable and curable is really important. So I think that, um, better strategies to engage with communities. And I think that really hinges on um, partnerships with people in the community. So people affected by TB, but also community leaders. It's really kind of, it's important to sort of understand where do people go for advice? You know, they, they may go to their pastors in the church or they may go to traditional healers. And I think it's engaging with different um, people within this network to try to um, improve community awareness and really to destigmatize TB. Um, one of the projects that TB Proof um, um, has been involved with has been working with community health workers um, who are uh, under um, their their value I think is under acknowledged by health systems although they play an immense um, a sort of an immense role in helping people navigate the particularly the early stages of care in areas where care is, there's a lot of limitations in access to care and certainly access to high quality care. And so some of this work with community health workers has been to try to, to provide training for them about TB um, because their training is often not, it's not standardized and it's limited in terms of their knowledge base. Um, and then um, I uh, co-developing solutions with them. Um, so one of the things that they came up with was to, um, was to conduct a drama plays. They conducted theater plays in the community to try to engage with community members to destigmatize TB. And so it's really thinking about how to do that. The tricky thing is really trying to figure out how to do that well at scale. So that I don't certainly don't have all the answers for, but I think that that is very important. But I think a lot of it is understanding this has to be community led. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and, you know, finally, um, if you could talk to yourself when you were 21, knowing everything that you know today, um, what would you advise yourself? And I guess, a, you know, a further question would be, what would you tell somebody who's, you know, a young woman today who wishes to, you know, um, lead efforts uh, like you have? What advice would you give to your younger self and to other young women today who wish to create a change? 
Yeah, this is a good question. I was I was thinking a little bit about this and thinking how I would um I think I how I would break this down into three pieces M's. It's myself, mission and mentorship. Um because I think um the first one about myself and the it's really about understanding uh, so I think it's understanding about how you work, what interests you, um, what you are good at doing, what your strengths are, what, you, what your weaknesses are, and um, and how you um, how you kind of operationalize what you're interested in in doing. And I think it's important to think about this personally and professionally. And I think often when we're thinking about careers, we just focus on professional development and but it, I think it is very important to think about where you are personally and what matters to you but in terms of the myself the other th thing I wish I had known more about was was knowing that I think some basic sort of skills like time management organizational um, org organization and um, goal setting so I think some of these things come more naturally to some than than others I would say I have slowly um, I'm work in progress as well um, it's try to kind of think about how I manage my time and energy as well as how I organize things so I think it's really trying to understand who you are and how you um, how you work and and in what kind of setting would you work well in and then that kind of fits in next with the with the mission piece around what you what drives you? What do you care about? I was um, listening to a great talk in our Grand Rounds this morning by um, uh, Dr. Kimberly Manning, who is a professor of medicine at um, Emory University in Atlanta. And she um, is an um, internal medicine physician, but she writes a lot about narrative medicine and humanities, uh, humanity and medicine and storytelling. And one of the things that she said today was around, you've got to think about what makes you really angry and, uh, and, and thinking about how you might then go about and do something about that. So I think mission is important to not just think individually, but really think about something that matters kind of in a bigger picture so it makes me angry that people with tb are, are not well cared for or that we accept these low quality standards for tb um and uh you know I'll, I'll just say on that note that um that that covid19 i think presents a way to to say well we know that we can do better we know we've developed these amazingly effective vaccines in a short amount of time new diagnostics little bit less work on the treatment front but as a tb um uh, expert i'm sort of I, I and i think the whole tb community are thinking how can it be possible that this other infectious disease gets so little attention and funding and it's certainly not a competition but anyway what i guess the the point is is about thinking about what matters to you and how do you really choose activities and career op opportunities that will m push that mission forward that hopefully uh, doesn't just fulfill you personally but but add something to the wider community and then the, th the third piece is mentorship which i think i've also developed a much better understanding for over time which i think i didn't really know much about when i was 21. um so i think trying to i think if i identify people who you look up to and have interesting careers and get ideas from them and you know hopefully hear about their pitfalls as well as their successes and I think understand that those paths that you kind of see when you sort of look up online are definitely not um, linear and so I have lots of people that I really look up to and reach out to um, for different pieces of advice and I think it's also important to say it doesn't come from a single person and so I think those three pieces um, myself mission and um, mentorship uh, can I think that would be uh, would have been helpful advice to me and then I think to um, women think about careers in, in medicine I strongly encourage it especially in infectious diseases because we need you um, and I think that I guess I, getting back to the choose to challenge um, component I think one of the things we have to challenge is the ingrained systems uh, within medicine that I think make it very challenging particularly for women at different stages of the career and, and you know particularly I think for women who start families and I think there are sort of lots of big issues to sort of grapple with in terms of equal partnership in the home as well as in the workplace but I think focusing on the workplace I think we all at each step of the way from you know students obviously you feel that you don't have a lot of power but I think it's important to try to advocate for yourselves and within your communities and then at each step of the way up um, to really advocate for systems that will encourage um, equity and diversity at, along along the way and I think as we have more diverse leadership I think that that will which includes women which includes women of color and people of color more more broadly um, it will I think that will help I think to create systems where we can work in a way where we're less at risk of burnout and um, where women people of color can also succeed at you know to the highest echelons where then currently not reaching at the moment so i would so i would say um um so i'd say 
be ambitious and um but but build your community and networks and support each other um, that's very well put i think that's something that will stick with me for a while especially when you said think about what makes you angry <laughs> and what you'd like to change so yeah that's very well put um yeah thank you so much for joining us today and you know for providing us with um not only giving us so much knowledge about something that most people don't know much about but also about you know being very inspiring and insightful it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you and uh, yeah thank you so much thank you so much sophia thank you